Good morning. Good morning. So, you may know me from such movies as CF Engine and I um, moved on from configuration management for um, after several, well, many years doing, doing this. For me, it's an interesting year because it's not only is it the fifth year of configuration management camp, it's also 25 years since I wrote CF Engine in its first version. So we have an anniversary to celebrate. Um, I was looking for a title. I thought if I called something a brief history of, I might make a lot of money like Stephen Hawking did. But brief history of configuration is not all that brief. We've had these 25 years and things have changed a little bit, but perhaps not as much as we expect. These days we hear a lot of discussions about will the robots take over our jobs? Will automation replace human beings? But if you look at what's happening in configuration management, the people are all still here. You guys are still here. I see all your faces. I know you, many of you personally. Um, and the tools get replaced, the robots get replaced, but the humans are still here fighting. So this is uh, also an interesting thing to think about. Uh, Chris got uh, me involved in this, caught me early because often I'm busy at this time of year. And he tweeted, he made a tweet which I thought was, which sort of captured my imagination. He said, config management was the cure for VM sprawl. What's the cure for container sprawl? And I thought this was a nice question because, uh, well, first of all, I, it made me smile because for Chris, uh, VM sprawl was apparently the first kind of sprawl. For me, you know, I'm going back older than that, I started with the physical machines and data centers that looked like this picture in the background here with wires trailing over boxes and all the boxes were different shapes. Now all the boxes fit into these nice rack units. It wasn't like that uh, in the beginning. So um, to, be, to begin the story with virtual machines already seemed kind of interesting. Um, with the physical machines, you know, there was a range of... Uh, when you did configuration management, you were basically provided with a box which had an operating system installed on it already. Or if you were unfortunate, you had to buy an expensive tape machine and you'd get a tape and you would install uh, very slowly the operating system onto the disk from a tape. And then, of course, because this was a basic image that came from the operating system provider. You had to then go in manually by hand, log on, set up the first account, um, start tweaking files, configuration files to set it up, build every user manually. We've come a long way since then. When I started CF Engine, there weren't really that many tools um, that could automate those processes. It was still a very manual procedure and I got involved in doing this manually. I thought it was cool back in the beginning to do this manually, to learn how to do it. Unix is a very exciting environment, a lot of uh, complex systems. Everyone loves to play around with these systems and figure out how they work. And then after a month or two, uh, it started to get less interesting. It was taking time away from my real job, my day job, which was uh, doing physics at that time. So I decided to write an automation tool, and I was inspired myself by the great automation uh, scripts written in Perl, mostly from the University of Oslo, that had already done a great job in, um, in automating many functions. What I wanted to do with CF Engine was to try and take out a lot of the proceduralness of it and replace it with some nice declarative uh, state information um, that would describe the desired state of all systems in a very uncomplicated way. Back in this day of physical systems, it wasn't just the data centers that were messy, but at the university, people's needs were messy. We joke at the university, everyone's a special child, everyone's a special case, because everyone has special needs. It was never the case, like today with cloud, that you had um, everybody the same, a kind of cookie cutter model. So everybody had special needs and we needed a system to adapt to all of those special needs and not, um, not drive the sysadmin nuts, that was me. Um, so it had to be able to cope with that diversity, we needed a way to take all the different cases 
So in the beginning with CF Engine, we had different uh, classes to describe systems. Is it an AIX box, an IRIX box, an Ultrix box? Probably haven't even heard of most of these anymore. And then later, Linux came along, and so on, and so on, and so on. But um, if you think about the general principles of what's going on, we've seen you know, many, many technologies taking different approaches. And every time we, we come up with a new one, we, we think we're doing it right now. Now we're doing it right. The last version was wrong, but now we're doing it right. Um, but things, so the technologies have changed, but the actual things that we're dealing with, the, the issues that we face, they haven't changed so much. And what I want to do in this talk is try to describe that uh, what it is that we're trying to do in configuration, configuration management through these technologies. And for me, as again, I, you know, I started life as a physicist, so I tend to think in a physics-y kind of way, which helps me to separate issues from technology. For me, this is really about a separation of time scales. So I could have called it a brief history of time, or a brief history of time scales between what is happening quickly and what's happening slowly. Things that change slowly, fairly stable, a strong base, a foundation on which to build, and then things that change quickly, adapting to people's special needs as their challenges of work uh, change and, and they have to use that, you know, adapt their tools to the particular things that they're trying to do with. So I think Chris's comment was important because we tend to start all over again when we're faced with a new challenge in technology, we think we don't pick up the lessons that we learned in the previous iteration and take them forward. We tend to think, okay, those guys did it wrong. They, those guys with their horses, they don't even have a USB. But if we just invent our fancy new technology, yeah, we've got all the latest knobs and whistles and, and stuff, and we're going to do it right. And people start writing it all over again, and we make the same mistakes again, and we perhaps don't learn these lessons. So this is my kind of goal. How do we keep our stuff in order? Uh, and how does it change over time? The same question was, was answered also, or sorry, not answered, but it, the same question was uh, posed in programming, in data. If you think about data management, we started out in the 80s with simple databases. If you've got a bunch of data, stuff it into a database, a rigid schema, try to make everything look the same. And we had a whole story about data normalization, saying that in order to keep uh, control of the data, in order to be able to address them clearly and um, uh, in a regular fashion, we need to normalize it, make everything the same. And we always start with that kind of argument. It's much simpler if everything looks the same, everything is homogeneous, then it's easier to deal with. But then, of course, comes in business value and business purpose. We need to adapt these things that are supposed to look all the same to a particular case. And that requires some tweaking. And that's when things start to diverge and depart from the norm. So we're constantly faced with this conflict of interest between trying to keep things cheap, like stuffing it into a database, and then you know, with a rigid schema, and then going all schemaless as we, we do today, we talk about even in databases today, where we have to adapt something to a very special set of circumstances. So I want to give you my perspective on what we're really trying to do from the point of view of these principles and how this relates to infrastructure management in general. Just as a point of interest, what I've been doing over the last few years has been related to IoT and smart cities, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, the planning of spaces, not just, um, not just computing spaces, but smart spaces, both for humans and for machines, within data centers, within homes, within uh, cities and within countries. And there are a lot of principles that we can take from these and try to scale them. So the key question is, how do we get from anarchy to order? How do we get from the left-hand picture to the right-hand picture? And we see this, I, I, probably nobody in this room would, would question that the, the shift from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is some kind of an improvement, some kind of a, an advancement to a better state of things. Although, by the end of this talk, I, I hope you might 
actually question your belief in that because it's, it's not 100% clear. So how do we get from anarchy to order, from configuration to town planning? There's definitely a configuration on the left-hand side here. People have put together structures by hand, manually gone in and set up accounts and built identities, installed uh, software. They've got little tools running around at the bottom there. But on the right-hand side, things have been tidied away. Things have been modularized. Um, the number of degrees of freedom seem to have been reduced, so it looks simpler. Now, what I want to argue is that that's an illusion of scale to a large extent. If you go and dig into these large buildings and see what's really going on, you'll find a lot of the mess uh, that you see on the left-hand side there. But we've kind of tidied it away. We've hidden it into the walls. There's still a lot of random electrical wiring that's all exposed on the left. It's still there on the right-hand side, but we've put it inside the walls. We've put it inside nice buildings and we've modularized them by building walls around it so that it looks clean, looks separable. And what we're doing at that stage on the right-hand side is not really simplifying things. The modularity that we see on the right-hand side, which is sort of a hallowed principle in IT and in, in data management, is sort of illusory because we've simply chosen not to see a bunch of stuff which is definitely there. So a lot of dealing with complexity, dealing with configuration, is not about getting rid of it or replacing it or doing it better. It's simply about hiding it. And of course, that was the whole idea behind procedural programming, creating functions and, pro uh, and uh, procedures in programs, that you would you'd hide the complexity of your go-to riddled code by making subroutines that you could attach a single name or a single, a single building to a particular function. So why this obsession with tidiness? Um, I've asked myself this question many times. We definitely believe in tidiness in IT. We think that if we make something tidy, in other words, if we can reduce something to a simple number of functions without too much spaghetti code, as we like to say, then somehow we've improved it. But this picture in the middle should show you that the most successful systems on our planet are quite messy. The rainforest is a perfect example. Biological complexity is a perfect example of how very intricate complexity, which is all over the place, slightly modularized with your trees and your animals and, and so on, but, but pretty much overlapping mess, looking far more like the left-hand side than the right-hand side. These are the most successful and robust systems on our planet. They've been around for billions of years, whereas our cities fall down quite quickly, relatively speaking. So what is it about that complexity that survives, and why are we so obsessed with the right-hand side if the left-hand side is more honest in some, some way? Of course, a key difference between the rainforest and computers is that computers are uh, explicitly under attack from people. And our human semantics, our human purposes, tend to drive us to um, try to tear down and break these systems. You know, we're slightly strange beings. You know, human beings are a bit odd. In the rainforest, people are just trying to survive. But in human space, we're trying to kill each other. It's still a strange thing. And when we think about that, we're trying to build defensive perimeters around things. And a lot of these modular structures that we build in IT are motivated by this need to build defensive walls around parts of a system. Interestingly, again, by the end, I hope you will question that belief, because interestingly, by building a wall and isolating something, we're actually making it less robust in some sense. What makes the right-hand side compelling is that we, we, we can define templates for creating things. We can determine systems, make systems look more deterministic by hiding away a lot of the things that appear to be complex. And by reducing the number of degrees of freedom and trying to absorb all of that mess in, into infrastructure so we can't see it anymore, then we can concentrate on those few degrees of freedom that are left on top that we associate with business purpose. 
So we keep our minds uncluttered, we try and hide it away, and we try to absorb complexity into infrastructure. And this is the pattern that technology follows over time. And I want to come back and say a little bit more about that. So, lifetime of technology, the stages of hubris, because in a way, you know, all technology, all civilization is a kind of hubris. But one of the basic lessons that we have to come back to again and again is that we tend to start out thinking big. We tend to think with our hubris that we can master this if we just, you know, we are Klingons. We can fight this thing. We can destroy it in battle with our, our super tools and we'll figure it out. And so we try to build an entire system, take over the entire world. Uh, I did it with, first with CF Engine, then a lot of uh, other tools came along, then we did it with things like the cloud. Now we're doing VMs and containers and so on. Whatever your preferred approach, you tend to think we will take over the world and, dis and describe the entire problem. Gradually, as uh, we get bitten by the complexity of that, we break it up into smaller pieces and leave and redefine the problem so that our entire world is a rather smaller piece of that larger problem. But we think big, and we think grand unified management. How can we deal with the whole thing and make it simple? And gradually, we don't do too well, we fail a bit, things change, because of course the underlying technologies are changing as well, and we have to adapt. And uh, along come new tools. So we, in, as an, an organization that's been using one tool, trying to migrate to another tool or another approach is a huge challenge, which is rooted in culture. And there's this cultural inertia uh, for us as human beings to shift our approach or to shift our technologies from one method to the next method. And this, of course, is why the robots aren't just going to come and ride roughshod over all of us, because we will be in the way, fighting them at every stage. But occasionally we do make uh, choices, make changes from, from tool to tool or from technology to technology. And gradually, you know, we install a little bit of it and we deprecate the old thing. I heard, <laughs> I heard um, some years ago when I was still working at CF Engine, I remember talking to some guys at Amazon. And they, uh, the guy we were talking to had never heard of CF Engine, even after 20 years. And he went back to his, his uh, department and said, have you ever heard of CF Engine? He said, yeah, we're using it all over the place. And it's, uh, in all our systems. But gradually over the years, it's been dialed back to the point where we've got this entire software stack managing one file. And all of the other stuff is managed by something else. So gradually, you know, our favorite technologies, they, they almost never go away, but they, <laughs> their footprint gets reduced we reduced and reduced and reduced, and eventually we have the courage to sort of rip them out and say goodbye, give them a decent burial. But uh, it's a hard job to remove software. So these are the kinds of issues that we deal with in configuration management. There's a whole bunch of different things. Um, key to these, you know, and this is some approximate order that I just scribbled down, but. Uh, key to this is that we're dealing with human computer systems. This, I think, has come out nicely in um, the DevOps uh, discussions of the recent years, that it's not just uh, about technology, although the technology part is hard enough, but it's about how humans and technologies interact. And we saw that on the previous slide, where even the questions of adoption are, are key. So, like everyone else, I used to do all of these things manually, and enjoyed it for a little while, because I was learning. But then at some point I stopped learning and it became oppressive. And so I wrote CF Engine back in 1993 to do this. So to cut a long story short, what I wanted to do is to capture some of those invariant things, some of those things that we always need in systems um, and absorb them into a kind of an infrastructure, just as the previous slides absorbed this kind of shanty town into a beautiful city. So how, can we put, how could we put uh, stuff a lot of that complexity into a box and automate it out of sight, out of mind? Um, and these, these poles of the problem, I, I sketched them out. Um, context, semantics, dynamics. So context is 
the context, the, the circumstances in which you're operating, the business circumstances in which you're operating, if you like. Semantics, what does it mean to us? What's the value uh, proposition behind what we're doing? And dynamics, how are things changing? How fast are things changing? What things are changing? And so on. Uh, the, the dynamics is always the fundamental thing. If you can't control how things change, you certainly can't associate any meaning with it, and you certainly can't adapt anything to a context. So you always start with the dynamics and try to get that under control. So, and the key things there are speed and scale. And so these questions of time, time scale, um, numerical num numbers of things, these come back to haunt us again and again. And the combination of these things, as you see, I've drawn them around this uh, central thing about promises. Um, Back in the um, early 2000s, I was looking for a model to try to put all of these things into some order in my mind, and I came up with this notion of a promise as a way to describe how things change, what they mean to us, and the context in which we, we, uh, we specify things. So we, by making certain promises, by asking whether our systems can obey certain, keep certain promises, it's a, a simple uh, way of discussing the problem that can be tied down in a fairly rigid way. These three poles also tie neatly in. So context is about our situation awareness, how we look at what we're doing, how we adapt to it. And that's a cognitive process. This is where humans tend to excel in identifying the contexts. What do we need and where do we need it? And having that continuous interaction with systems which tends to get under, underestimated when we go into automation. We think that if you know, automation can become a hands-off kind of uh, uh, game, but actually, unless we maintain a deep, a continuous personal relationship with the system, we don't know what it's about. We lose, uh, we lose sight of it. We don't know when changes need to be made. So it. It's incumbent on us as system administrators or as um, IT folks or whatever we want to call ourselves these days to maintain a relationship even though we're not necessarily doing things manually and by hand anymore. Again, this is challenging because the way our brains are wired is to control our hands. And so when we think about something, we immediately want to do it with our hands. And we tend to build technologies in ways that allow us to basically push buttons or pull levers as extensions of our hands. CF Engine was kind of an, uh, an exception to that. I tried to take hands totally out of it. But then we saw that people couldn't wait to put the hands back in uh, because it was too much. We took too much, uh, um, took away too much of the interaction that people saw. And so they felt disconnected from from systems, and we've been through various, if you look through the, the, the evolution that Chris talked about, the waves of technology, how they've gone back and forward and added a bit of hands-on, taken the hands-on away. Everything from you know, manual configurations to cloud management and image management. On that entire spectrum of scales, we're, we, we've always needed to have an interaction and a knowledge of the system, a cognitive awareness. The interaction part, the change part, we, we want to do it manually, but we know we can't scale that. So we're, we're trying to take away as many of those things and abstract them and absorb them into an infrastructure that we don't want to think about. So this separation of concerns that we're dealing with in, in IT configuration management is not about taking the entire problem and automating it. It's about how to separate what we want to manage from what we don't want to manage. What can we hide and absorb into a solid infrastructure? And what can we uh, leave on top for us to play around with with our hands so we feel engaged? Now, um, Simon Wardley, I don't know if any of you know Simon Wardley. He's uh, quite prolific on Twitter. He has a system of maps that I find quite compelling way to think about uh, technologies. And his idea is that we can draw a map like the, these axes here, axes here. Along the bottom, we start out with the evolution of products from the beginning 
on the left to the sort of natural end state on, on the end. And on the, the vertical axis, we have uh, business value or value to society, if you like. And there are many things that this kind of map can show us. So the first thing is his observation is that the evolution of a piece of technology tends to start out with fiddling around with sticks you know, to see what we can do. The genesis stage, sticking stuff together and seeing what we can do. And then gradually we'll get a bit better and we'll figure out how to build custom systems for people uh, and adapt, do special jobs. And then we'll productize things and things will get more standardized. And you may have multiple products. Eventually things become commoditized. They become so standardized that everyone's using the same thing. It becomes much more homogeneous. And in the end, it becomes a utility. So by turning on the tap, you get out water, electricity, and so on. Cloud. Yeah. And you see all technologies tend to follow this, this path. Occasionally they take steps backwards. And the question is, why do they do that? Well, in the vertical axis, the business value associated with these changes um, goes up as we go up. And the broad trend is that we start in the bottom left and we go to the top right, because if we overlay another kind of uh, perspective onto this, we s you see that we start out, again, trying to figure out how to do things. And then we figure out what it is we're trying to do. Yeah, it usually goes that way around. We don't always know what we're trying to do until we figure out how to do it. And then we figure out why we were trying to do it as we get better and better, and eventually it becomes a kind of a goal. So we go from this kind of micromanagement of rubbing sticks together and managing every little detail and plugging it and fixing it and manipulating it up to that kind of Captain Picard, make it so stage where we have the goal, the desired end state, and we just say, make it so. This is a knowledge ladder. This is the, this is the evolution of knowledge. From data, how, to information, the what, knowledge, why, and then wisdom is kind of the goal part. So it's this evolution of knowledge as we build on things that have come in the past. And we associate the, the fiddling with human interactions, the products and commodities with a kind of a robotic stage, an automation stage, and then the utility stage is kind of magic. You know, we've automated so much of it in so fancy where it's disappeared into the walls, we barely know anything about it. And as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced infrastructure is indistinguishable from magic. So this is our cloud level where we just turn on the tap and we get all these fantastic services. So I find this um, map kind of interesting because as, if you move in different directions, for, for example, as you climb upwards, you can build on things that have been uh, built previously to increase the value. You put together a bunch of things, you increase the value to something else. And, but it tends to become more manual as we put things together again. So that backward arrow towards spin-offs shows how new technologies come from older technologies by spinning off things or by putting things together. And then improvement, general improvement, tends to follow this large diagonal. So if we try to lay out some of the issues that we deal with in IT on this map, and I just threw together some, some kind of random things, you'll see that generally from left to right, we go from these, uh, can you read that? It's maybe a bit unclear, but we have things like uh, compliance, which is a high value thing. A lot of people are willing to pay to have compliance and safety and, and so on. And then all of these low value things like monitoring human, human stuff, manual repairs, these, these low level things are what get built on to build up those high level functions. And we can try and lay out the technologies on this scale. Again, a little bit random, but you see the various stages of evolution and configuration management. Again, starting out rubbing sticks together, plugging the wires into the boxes. Then we do the CLI scripts. We've got our black boxes. And then you've got the things like CF Engine and, and Chef and Puppet and whatnot. Uh, and then building on that, we, we start to 
be able to make things like uh, virtual machines and containerized systems. The values are going up, it's getting easier, it's more homogeneous, more commoditized, and, you know, I'm not sure I totally believe my placement on these things, but you get the idea that as things uh, spin off from previous technologies, they tend to go a little bit backwards, and then we gradually try to keep moving on this upward spiral like this. Um, another kind of version of this, I want to sort of, uh, manipulate his diagram a little bit. Because this leading diagonal is so important, let's just take that as a, as a line and try to overlay it onto another version, which is um, now I've overlaid that diagonal moving towards the center so that instead of going from left to right, we're going from outside to the center of this, this circle. So this is a version of Simon's maps where the center means high business value, mature, utility, commodity technology. And we see that the way we tried to separate concerns in the past by making silos, particularly around networking, compute, and storage, this, is, this was driven by productization, right? So in, in the middle stages of config, uh, technology config management, we have this separation into silos in order to separate concerns. But the natural evolution of technologies to, to integrate all of these silos back again into some um, more homogeneous mix, a kind of a mess again. We thought we were doing a, a service to the world by separating these different things, but actually we need all of them together, so we just tend to create added complexity at a new scale by trying to reconnect these things later. And we've seen this in cloud services. You build a separate compute part, a separate network technology, a separate storage technology, and then you have a hell of a lot of trouble trying to integrate them back together again, which is exactly the problem people are facing today in cloud with whether it's OpenStack or Kubernetes or whatever. And there are a dozen different technologies trying to do this in different ways. Um, I have my opinions on that. but. The natural goal, by following this kind of utility thinking, is to get back to this um, common homogeneous set of boxes again, where everything becomes the same, and there's no separation between compute, network, and storage. And we can talk about that later. It has an interesting parallel in the evolution of cities. And I've said, I've written actually in the last few years about the, a lot of the relationships between cities and software. So I believe there are many lessons we can learn. But um, in the 60s and 70s, there was an interesting uh, movement in architecture called the Garden City Movement, where architects wanted to really tidy up cities. They'd seen these incredible masses, and this was especially popular in South America. Uh, Brasilia was one, of the, one example of this. But what they thought they could do was to separate the functions of the city into these modules. So you'd have your living, your residential, your business area, CBD. You'd have your shopping area. You'd have your entertainment area and so on. And they thought this, would, this was super, you know, so tidy, so beautiful. And then lovely garden space in between, everyone's happy. Didn't work like that because what happens? Everyone gets stuck in their car driving from one place to the next because everyone needs to go shopping and then they need to go back home and then they need to go out to the cinema. And then, so everyone's in a car most of the time driving between these different silos. And the same thing is true in computing, of course. All of the burden is placed on the networking when you separate things into different silos and containers. And so <laughs> this, this need to uh, make things separate comes back to haunt us. And the natural evolution of that in the center, here I stuffed in a little picture of Hong Kong, could be any kind of typical Chinatown, is an example of a business district which works very efficiently because everything's just a big mess on top of everything else. Everything's very short distance from everywhere else. People get around, they talk to each other, everything they need is in a, a block's radius, and it works really well. There's no driving, you know, it, it, it's old fashioned, it looks messy, it looks like that shanty town, but actually it's efficient, dynamically efficient. 
the question is, can we scale that to a large size? And that is the infrastructure challenge. That is the challenge we're really trying to address. It's not about should we be doing it with, um, you know, in C code or in Python or in uh, Go or whatever the latest thing is. It's about can we identify the circumstances and the major functions and integrate them at a level that can be scaled and separated in a good way. Here are some uh, tech things placed on that diagram and you see more primitive, more ad hoc around the edge and then as we get into the center more integrated. Uh, now there's this buzz phrase, what is it? Um, Hyperconvergence is the, the latest buzz phrase. Basically it's, you know, again, instead of having a separate box for your storage, one for the compute and and a network catastrophe in between, well, why not just have everything tightly integrated? I even heard uh, a talk by someone some time ago where the idea was that you could make storage simply an extension of the, the cache layers in the CPU. And I believe this is how eventually it'll happen. Even to the extent where now we sort of have this idea that it's a good idea to send everything to Amazon's basement to compute um, in the future, you know, we got, we're surrounded by computers everywhere. There's no need to send traffic halfway around the world to compute something when you have your computer right in front of you. But now that's kind of heresy because cloud. In the future, I think, uh, we will simply have one giant cloud and all of these devices around us will be part of it. Probably Amazon will still be managing it, but the computer will be in next to your electricity meter at home or under your TV. And that will, you know, like your set-top boxes or whatever, that will be uh, the utility service that is cloud computing. And it won't be huge data centers anymore. It will be spread around like a rainforest. Here are some uh, specific technology. I tried to stick these on here. Again, you see the trend. All of these things from, from uh, sort of cobbled together OpenStack systems, gradually getting more and more integrated into um, virtualized systems. This is, you know, nice. We're not terribly good at doing this, but it's happening slowly. But what I think is more interesting is to, and a more lasting picture that emerges from this game is to look at how the timescales get managed. Because as technologists, we, we should understand that uh, the way to solve problems is to manage fluctuations, deviations, changes at the time scale at which they happen. Think of planes. Planes that need to fly basically in a straight line are big and fat, 747s, A380s. They just need to be very, very stable. They, they basically fly in a straight line from one place to another, that's it. Super stable. And then you have your fighter jets that need to roll around, adapt to, you know, avoid anti-aircraft missiles and so on. They need to be very unstable. They need to react quickly. So they need to have, they need to operate on totally different time scales. Your, A, your A380, very slow, stable. Your fighter jet, very fast, very unstable. And the, the problem is that it costs you much more to manage your fighter jet. You need your 12 computers running simultaneously and you need to monitor the hell out of everything around you and you may get away with it. So if we look at the timescales uh, associated with computing, they go all the way up to very, very fast CPU cycles. Uh, the clock cycles of the CPU, 10 to the minus nine, 10, 10 to the minus 10 seconds, I claim, at the top there. And then you have things like memory lookup, a bit slower, packet switching, a bit slower, collisions, a bit slower, TCP sessions, much slower, and so on and so on, all the way down to human changes, things that we can do. And of course, it would be nonsense for us to think that as humans, we could manually fix something to do with clock cycles on the CPU, right? If there's a, an error in the CPU, we couldn't do that by hand. We can't do it that fast. So we need technology to help us. But of course, we can 
design the circumstances, the purposes, the, the semantics of it at a much slower scale. So the separation between the doing and the thinking can be separated over a, a much wider time scale. If we overlay some of these technologies onto these time scales, we see how we redefine the technologies as the time scales change. So in the olden days, not much happened that, was, that couldn't be fixed by changing a DNS record with a TTL of you know, minutes or hours. Uh, then we needed to do things faster, and that's when the Puppet Chef CF engines come in, and to scale things uh, requires more speed. And then things getting even faster, we don't have time to, to reconfigure things manually anymore because things are being spun up and spun down so fast that by the time the job is finished, you know, the, the config tool hasn't even started. So we need to do it in a different way. We need to reorganize our time. What I always wanted to do, you know, I never wanted CF Engine. I always wanted to fix the operating system so that it would do it automatically. But of course, no access. If you can't get in there, you build an agent to try and work for you. So that's why agents. But you don't want agents, you want the agents to be in the operating system, to be part of the infrastructure, part of that invisible foundation. It's just that you don't always have the access, you can't always get there. So you work around it. And of course, computing is a study in working around problems that we can't get into. I find the discussion about System D to be an interesting one because Regardless of implementation issues, and I know very little about the implementation of System D, I think the idea of having a master daemon fixing the operating system at the core is so what you want to do that it's beyond doubt that that is the way forward for improving operating systems rather than having the kind of shantytown mess of multiple config files and multiple daemons and this and that that we've got today in our ad hoc piece together systems. We've got that mess, we're trying to build that civilization on the right hand side, and we can't quite get there because, you know, human fighting, human conflicts. So there's an interesting challenge that we have to face, which is getting in the way of adapting to these timescales in a, an optimal technological way, and that is the human problem. The DevOps challenge is a human computer issue. So how do we get beyond uh, our limitations, if you like? Um, if we think about other systems, like cars, for instance, how we manage the time scales there. You have long time scales for building and designing. You have your service operations, maintenance things that need to be done every 10,000 miles or so. You need the refueling, it's a bit faster, and then you, you've got your navigation, which is faster still. These things are clear separation of concerns that we've managed to handle fairly well. We're not as good at managing that separation when it comes to computers because we, we want to cling on to those jobs that we've done in the past. This is a form of knowledge management. Again, which things am I interested in dealing with? Which things do I want to manage and coddle like a pet? And which things do I want to outsource like cattle? We love that analogy between cattle and pets in sysadmin. But actually, it's about the timescales. It's not about whether you care deeply about your pets more than your cattle. If you're a business person, you care about your cattle. It's really about, have I got time to give every one of them a name and stroke them and pet them and so on? Well, um, my feeling is that if we want to get beyond this um, human barrier, we need to recognize the way that humanity works in when it comes to technology. The thing that was a struggle for me to learn over the years is that people don't go for the best technologies. 
People don't look for the best solutions. It's very tribal. We treat our technologies like sports teams. We, we say, I'm a puppet supporter, I'm a chef supporter, I'm an open stack supporter, I'm a cloud stack supporter, I'm a Kubernetes supporter, I'm a Mesos supporter. And people stay in their camps and they love the games. But it's quite rare and it's quite hard to make a transition from one idea to another. Even people who love their CF engine or their puppet or their chef may find it hard to go to Docker, which is a different way of thinking about the timescales. And people look at it and they think, oh, wait, this, this was a spin-off. It slid backwards somehow. We have, we've got these beautiful config languages that are, are neat and elegant, and now you want me to do some silly script in a container? But actually, yeah, it's messy, it's primitive, it, it's, it doesn't look as professional, perhaps, but it gets the job done at the right speed. And so the system is not waiting for the human issue to be solved. And this is the problem that we, we, that we struggle to, to identify in ourselves, that we are intensely tribal about the technologies that we use, and we're more interested in supporting our guys and our team than we are in solving necessarily the correct business problem with the optimum degree. And that's an ethical question, right? What is the correct thing to do? And I don't know what the answer is because um, ethically it's good that people are happy. So if people love their tribe, that's great. If that gets in the way of your employer's business problem, then it's less clear. Is your happiness more important than your employer's prosperity? Well, if it becomes your prosperity as well, you know. So it's a, it's a, a, dis, a tricky uh, discussion to have, but time and again, we see human interests getting in the way of technological innovation. Now, at the beginning, I said that mess and tidiness in technology, technological advancement looks, is largely a function or an illusion of scale. And you see, again, this mess on the left and this beautiful city on the right. If you zoom out and look at the big city as it grows, it starts to look like this picture in the middle. And if we're honest, it looks a bit more like the left-hand side than the right-hand side. As the complexity grows, as the scale grows, it looks messy again. And this is the challenge that we face in dealing with ourselves, being honest with ourselves. We thought we'd solved the problem at one scale, but then we get another scale altogether and we have to do it again. That thing that we compressed into a building, a single building, well now we have four buildings and we need to connect the buildings together and people need to go from one to the other. And how do they do that? So we wire the system together in an ad hoc manual fashion. Now at a new scale we've automated these super buildings but now we have to wire the buildings together manually. And again and again and eventually we build systems to do it, and buses, and so on and so on. And then there's multiple cities. How do we get from one city to another? Oh, we wire them together with a road, a traffic. At every new scale, there are ad hoc things. We slide backwards into ad hocness, and we're trying to evolve into this um, knowledge-based, uh, goal-based, declarative, if you like, uh, future. We've gone transistors, VLSI, mainframes, PCs, Unix computers, servers, cloud, and now microservices. So microservices are kind of going backwards again. We want to break up all of that beautiful integration that we, we did. Okay, well, maybe that's the way to answer another kind of an issue because the world around us has changed. So, for Chris's question, how do we manage container sprawl? It's the same way that we manage any sprawl, and that is by building scale, building layers, and then trying to integrate things, simplify things, commoditize things, turn things into utilities. This uh, immutable infrastructure business that came up a few years ago I think is a bit of a red herring as well. 
Immutability is one of those arguments. What people really mean is disposable, right? When, when they say that you shouldn't change something, you should simply delete it and, and make a new one, what they're really saying is that the things we really care about for stability are already abstracted away, and the things that remain on top we don't care too much about. They're disposable. We don't need to reconfigure them or preserve them. We, we just throw away modern furniture, we throw away modern buildings, we tend not to adapt them or re rebuild them or try to preserve them or adapt or make them into something else. It's a change of, um, a change of thinking which is based on these timescales. When Kubernetes came out, I realized that it was built in a very similar way to CF Engine. Many of the principles were very like CF Engine, self-healing, the convergence to a desired end state. These things were very, very similar, but addressed at a totally different scale. Instead of at a single box, it was at a single uh, a cloud, a deployment of interacting containers. And the things that had been hidden, like the networking connections, were corresponded to things that had been hidden in the system of, uh, of Unix through CF Engine, through these declarative statements, looked very much like the things coming out in um, Kubernetes. So if we look with different eyes, we can see there are many patterns that get repeated as we rebuild technologies. And we, sh we would do well to focus less on the particular tools and more on how we separate issues by time scale and whether or not we want to be closely involved as humans in the decision-making processes as they go along. So did we learn anything? Something, clearly. Perhaps not as much as we would have liked. Um, this tribalism that we experience in the community could be harnessed to great purpose or it could be a, an incredible hindrance to moving forward. So as we go and listen to the other talks and as you work with your own technologies, just ask you to think about those issues and, and, and think, is there something that we can do as a group to try to figure out which parts of the problem are in our best interests as human beings to solve with close human manual attention and which things we can simply absorb into the infrastructure and make go away altogether. Thank you.